for centuries, we have kept our vigil. We have watched and waited for the dark spawn to return. There are those who have doubted, who have forgotten. But it has always been our duty to remember in peace, vigilance, in war, victory, in death. What it means to be a gray warden. Oh my god, the tone of this game is so good. You play one of the eight intros of the game that will have slight story impacts later in the game, then boom, you're an Ostagar, immediately meeting the king of the realm, a young noble man who is sympathetic to the player, and you are informed of a great impending battle. The history nerd in me is like, wow, this is what it must have been like to be at Thermopylae. The tension is rising, shit's going down. Get over here, you son of a bitch. I'm gonna turn your horns into your goddamn cup. Yeah! Wow, did you see that, King? I did it! Oh no, oh god. What happened to you, bro? <coughs> now that's how you establish a freaking setting, people. Stuff's going down. People be dying. You don't need some wild plotline about how the entire multiverse is gonna be destroyed just because some stupid teenager got out edged by some other edgy dude. I'm a simple guy with simple needs. Give me a cool world to play in some good characters they care about, and I'll defend a freaking barn from some lame-ass coyotes like I'm smiting sour on himself from the face of Middle-earth. I've liked Dragon Age Origins for a long time. I've gotten every ending, every side quest outcome, and beaten the game through multiple times. That ain't easy for a story-driven game to pull off. There are entire game genres dedicated to the goal of infinite replayable content. These games are designed with the idea that each subsequent playthrough should invoke a unique experience in order to create an engaging and timeless gameplay loop. Get to the turrets. Maya, look out, look out, look out. Stay by the turrets. Get some heals. <laughs> so why have I put an insane amount of time into replaying this game that's just chock full of fantasy tropes instead of one of these other games? With a world that sounds like the Webster's definition of an RPG, and graphics that were even dated for the time. How do I keep going through the same quests over and over? Ah! By all the beards of my ancestors! How did you... Where did you come from? <laughs> you made a hole in my wall! I swear, this city is going to the criminals and the nuts. It's the freaking writing! Shit isn't all convoluted, the characters all have clear motivations for doing things, not one of these characters thinks there's some evil individual and can be disillusioned into changing sides or beliefs. I hereby pledge my oath of loyalty to you until such a time as you choose to release me from it. I am your man, without reservation. It's always a little weird when a game lets the player show the villain they were a dickhead, then see them realize they was a dickhead, and try to redeem themselves. Obviously, there are definitely cooler characters in other media that do a great job of carrying their respective stories. But what lets Dragon Age's characters stand on their own is that in the context of the game's world and stories, these people act so damn consistently and believably, it adds that extra layer of, oh, of course that would happen, or, oh, that makes sense, to the world. This game even had some actually good DLC! Along with cool side quests that you had to complete to get the best in slot gear for your team, Going on these item side quests, a lot of which don't actually have a quest giver, they're just tasks the player has to figure out, to get these high level items was one of the game's most enjoyable aspects that I don't see a lot of reviews talk about. A lot of RPGs struggle with gear progression in their later stages, where you might go on a 4 hour quest just to get some marginally better equipment. In most video games, equipment upgrades are always at the forefront of a player's mind, but once you get that final item, you instantly lose an entire aspect of the game. You have nothing left to loot. Nothing's really better than what you have. But have too many good armor sets and late game upgrades can feel trivial. Some games try to circumvent this problem with equipment that is only best in certain situations. Think type advantages. Dragon Age avoids this problem entirely because it has a bunch of companions that you can equip out with lesser gear. Every major area has its own special high tier set of armor that you can get by exploring. But wait, it's not quite as good as my DLC armor? Well, give it to Sten. 
gameplay kind of blows, not gonna lie. You can do some pretty crafty stuff with traps and AoE spells and buffs. But you really only have to whip that stuff out on Nightmare difficulty. And even then, you only have to get really tactical on a couple of tough encounters. On lower difficulties, you totally don't even have to touch the stuff, and the game's combat seems much simpler. I wonder if the devs knew about this though, because mechanics like traps and poisons are a pain in the ass to be honest, but completely unnecessary in the most popular difficulties. I've never seen anyone really use these mechanics on anything but Nightmare difficulty, which has undoubtedly enhanced their experience with the game as to opposed to having to apply poison to your weapon at the beginning of every fight in the middle of combat or else half your party gets injured! Get back to the review! I've always found the genre of a role-playing game to be so broad it's nearly worthless, because a game is never just an RPG, it's always paired with some other thing. In Dragon Age's case, it's an RPG, but also an adventure game. You experience this world through questing, and all of these adventures are fueled, in Origins, by the writing as opposed to other games that are heavily carried by their combat. Origins uses foreshadowing extremely effectively, with side plots unfolding parallel to the player's travels, building tension, the world is constantly dripping with atmosphere and context that colors your current and future experiences. Like, one of your companions has some backstory relating to one of the four areas you have to go to in order to complete the main story. If you don't use this companion or don't talk to him because you don't like him, no problem, the game doesn't make you stop and go check out his voice lines before letting you stab the next baddie. But if sarcasm and anti-swooping take your fancy, then you'll find out ahead of time that the ruler of Redcliffe's younger brother is a pretty cool dude. So when you do end up meeting him and learn about his brother's coma and see how he's taken charge during this recent crisis, you're like, Oh shit, of course my boy Tegan will pull up, he's the freaking man who can! Fucking MVP out here. The team over at Bioware, at the time, knew what their game's strengths and weaknesses were and played to its strongest aspects, using its strong narrative to enhance other aspects of their game in subtle ways that aren't, oh please follow me while I vomit exposition at you, always in this fun learning about the story, thanks for subscribing to Audible. Question, why is it in an MMO when the dude tells you to go kill 10 wolves to level up, it's a stupid busy quest, but when the Billboard in Dragon Age tells you to go kill three groups of bandits outside of town. That's a proper side quest. It's cause in an MMO the player is just trying to level, while in Dragon Age the player just spent hours going through a refugee camp in town that was plagued by bandit attacks. When a game like freaking Sonic 06 tells you you have to go travel the world to go save this princess cause she's gonna give Sonic a kiss or something, you go what the fu- Nah, this whole world's whack! I'm flying off the map just running to the next level, man! Fucking snowboarding up hills, and I don't even care about this chick cause she ain't even got cat ears! That's cause the devs tried to tie your motivation to a weak ass part of the game! You can get a player to start an adventure on the most benign of things, so long as you tie their experience to something good. And oh my god, the ending. It has an actual payoff. You start off the game fucking... <coughs> then the whole game, you're out here doing some... And then finally, after all of that, everything actually starts coming together. Those dudes you went out of your way to add to the army help you in the final fight. That loser you spared is freaking lightning blasts at the Archdemon. It's all very cathartic. Bioware had a great understanding of the player's headspace, always making sure that the second you finish some cool quest, two more are on the horizon. They do a great job of sprinkling in details about the lore and backstory, but they're never too in your face about it. If you do decide to listen to it, however, it's always designed to motivate you to continue and pursue the plot in many side quests. Or, you know, it's just funny. He took off all his clothes in the middle of the chant one summer day and ran into the street. He tripped and fell into the vat of elderberry wine for the feast and drowned. We were six days drying him out for his cremation. He looked like a pickled egg. So tragic. For instance, one of your earlier companions is a priest who explains the religion in the game whose followers praise the maker. And this dude chose this random chick to be his wife, right? So then, get this, the mad lass gathers tortured people from the different races and rises in rebellion against the magical empire, bringing freedom to all, before getting tragically betrayed, being burnt at the stake by her allies, becoming immortalized as the prophet to a new religion. So when my boy Ben Tegan tells you he needs this B 
bitches ashes so a homeboy's brother can snort that shit to cure his demon-induced hangover? You know I'm on board with that shit, motherfucker. Our Lehman sends his regards, Warden. We're trying to keep the roads clear and safe. Darkness of the world and roasts not. Boasts. It's boasts, sister, not roasts. She shall know the peas of the Maker's benediction. Peace, sister, peace. She shall know the peace of the Maker's benediction. The veal, and she will know no fear of death. For the Maker shall be her bacon and her shield, her foundation and her... There's no veal in the chant. You're doing this on purpose, aren't you? Can we help you? Um, what she means is... In Andraste's name, be welcome. Stop correcting me! Unless there was no fuss budget. Why does no one ever sing the good stanzas during chantry services anymore? Sister, would you kindly stop messing up the chant? See how you like being interrupted? Lovely canticle, that one. Oh, you should have heard Brother Cademan sing it, though. He had a voice like a bucket full of toads. Revered Mother Boan, bless her heart, always said, if we had more voices like his, the Maker couldn't fail to take note of us. Grand Cleric Elamena understands the importance of concentration, you know. Her Grace, may the Maker bless her heart, lost her hearing 20 years ago. If she doesn't catch your blasphemous mistakes, it's because she didn't hear them. 